activity in the... Huh? What are you... Hey! What the hell are you doing? <laughs> Slow down, what you... Where the heck you taking me? <laughs> What's up? This is that guy, and you're watching a narration on... Beta Beginning's first season explodes with potential. Unfortunately, the execution isn't always there to lift it up. Let me take a few steps back here. There are a lot of things to like here with B. The art style is on point, and the amount of bloody decapitations featured here puts even The Walking Dead to shame. And for the Naruto fans, it's even got a Sasuke lookalike. Yeah, seriously, I dare you to spot the difference. The unnerving intro song greets you with the promise of a more profound viewing experience, while the outro's gritty nature reminds you of the anime's consistently bleak themes. You'll find a lot of sadness and death here, with very few beacons of light, and that's how I usually prefer my material, which explains why Gaunt, Ichi the Killer, and just Korean crime movies in general are at the top of my watch list. <laughs> Yeah, I'm weird, dude. The FBI is probably watching my search history as I speak. Beat the Beginning can be described as a hybrid between supernatural action and crime thriller. It juggles between a story of demigods fighting each other to the bloody end and human investigators trying to make sense of all the chaos. At one moment, you're dropping your jaw at the brutally intense fight scenes, and the next, you're piecing together clues to shed light on the mystery surrounding these conflicts. It has a constantly elevating pace from start to finish. One thing you won't be while watching B is bored, though you're gonna be about a hundred other things before the end. Chief among them is confused, but I'll get into that in a bit. B the Beginning has promising ideas and concepts that are introduced very early on which do their best to hook you in for the long haul. The problem here comes from the excessive emphasis on spectacle. Over substance, things just kind of happen in this anime without the initial context needed to understand them. There's an epic battle happening on screen, and you just won't feel emotionally attached to it at all. A gut-wrenching revelation has been made about a side character, and you're like, who even was that guy anyway? These were the common writing issues I ran into while watching this, as Be The Beginning comes across as an anime that said, hey, we want a murder mystery story, but with a crazy demon-like main character that can Terminator style turn his arms into blades. And as far as the explanation of all this, eh, don't worry about it. We'll think of something, eventually. But rather than continue raving about B's strengths and shortcomings, I'd rather walk you through them by starting off with the first episode. Right. Guess it's time for us to clean our kill. <laughs> There's a winged boy named Koku with bladed arms that kills criminals Dexter style. With every kill of his, Koku leaves a calling card of sorts, a weirdly drawn letter B. He leaves a symbol behind at every murder or incident that he's involved in. A group of similarly freakish individuals also catches wind of the boy's activities and, in an attempt to track him down, they pair up with the criminals and terrorists most likely to be targeted by the Dexter wannabe. And obviously, the police don't like criminals or serial killers, so they're investigating both parties, as well as the shady characters in the background who seem to be orchestrating all of these events. So, we're off to a good start, right? A good amount of mystery surrounding our winged protagonist, and a good amount of villains and side characters too. Did I mention that the winged boy also has amnesia? How about the retired veteran who suddenly comes back to the force after the bee killings happen? The story presented here leaves a lot of questions. Actually, at times, it feels like too damn many for me to follow. What I like most about B the Beginning is this uncertainty around who this winged boy is with these Dororo bladed arms, along with the questions of why this boy with a seemingly normal personal life, decides to use his supposed gifts to kill people. Throw in a retired detective who seems to be following this case for his own personal reasons, and 
It's a pretty captivating premise that keeps you coming back just to get answers. But what I don't like is being left in the dark for five whole episodes. A mystery is supposed to be vague and full of twists, sure, I get it. So it really depends on you to decide whether or not a slow burn mystery is something that appeals to you. If you figured it out, I've been hinting at an inevitable crap storm of answers that we get around episode 6, and oh what a superb crap storm of crammed exposition it is. Brace yourselves. It all began at the jet black. They call them the fossils of gods that flourished in the ancient past. This was the start of a project to restore these gods. Winged Boy Justice here's calling card actually isn't the letter B, it's the number 13. It's his personal identifier from his childhood, when he was a pet project of some scientists who discovered some magical bones of dead gods back in the 16th century. Oh yeah, this is gonna be one of those kind of stories. He leaves the number 13 symbol behind as a signal to a girl named Yuna that he's been looking for, who has also been subjected to the same experiments. Ooh. So yeah, basically, our boy Sasuke is doing all of this killing to find the girl he loves. That makes a lot of sense attention-wise, but what girl approaches a serial killer? I mean, hell, even if you guys were friends before, I don't think you're really friends now that you're a serial killer, so I don't know, I guess we'll see how this plays out, right? It also turns out that the group of superhumans chasing him were also trial test trials, but they're called Reggie's. No, not the smokable kind. And Reggie's are the failed experiments while Boy Wonder in his lowest lane are considered to be the successes. The failures go insane by adulthood, becoming dominated by their own primal urges, unless they take their urine sample colored antidotes on a regular basis. Though the successes don't go crazy and have more power potential due to the added boneless of being able to utilize the enhanced body parts of the failures in place of their own. I'm assuming these guys are skilled surgeons. Who? Okay. Yeah, it's absolutely a lot to take in. And catch this, I'm not even done explaining half of it yet. Keep in mind that this is still the same episode I'm talking about here, and this explanation in real time barely goes on for more than five minutes. This is what I mean when I say, Man, I love so many things about this anime at face value. The action, the visuals, the intrigue. But the execution by way of writing can really suck at times. Thinking about all that other stuff is a waste of time. From now on, I won't think anymore. What? Anyway, the one who reveals all of this information to us is that retired veteran detective. Because he is the son of the man who looked after the child experiments before a hit squad working for corrupt government officials killed his father. And the child experiments left behind are mostly killed or run away. But not before getting brainwashed by a mystery individual that brainwashes them to believe that they are going to be used for spare parts for Winged Boy main character. Because they're failures and he's a success. Successes harvest the body parts of the failures to gain power. But there's nothing set in stone to say that the veteran cops father was gonna make that happen or that the winged boy himself was gonna do it so it's just one of those things of like hey it could happen but hey it doesn't have to happen necessarily but anyway you understand paranoia brainwashing <sighs> okay yeah i warned you this is all crazy but once you get over the hump of daunting information in episode six then you're up to some smooth sailing. There's nothing left really to hold BD beginning back after that crammed exposition dump. Veteran detective and main protagonist team up, and we get a bit of time between the homie Sasuke and Sakura. Wait a minute, she really does have pink hair too. What the freak is? The focus of the anime pushes completely onto stopping the group of failed experiments called Reggie's and exposing the true culprit who influenced him from childhood to kill wings. You'll find a fair bit of cat and mouse on the detective side of things, and uncover some uncomfortable truths. At the end of the day, I wanted to like these characters. I wanted to root for them. I wanted to reach the end of this mystery. But unfortunately, B's writing just doesn't get you there. At least not all the way. You try to care about Koku and Yuno's bond, but you really don't. The veteran detective with the deceased father is good on paper, but in real time, he's just kinda there and exists. 
until the anime needs him to be smart, and the villains felt like a lot of their backstories were left on the cutting room floor. Like there are seriously villains in this anime that come across as more important than they actually are in the anime. Like they're 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 characters that are tied to Koku's past, right? And they make it a habit to say, "Yes, I'm from your past. Yes, we were this, we were that." And you honestly just don't care because you aren't giving that context ahead of time. No, it's just another thing that happens on screen. And if that character dies, well, you... Okay, you don't really care. B's first season is one of those weird anime that you know has a lot of potential. And there are a lot of things that you like at face value. So you keep coming back to it, hoping that it reaches that potential and gives you more things to like. And yes... I'm doing a lot of complaining, and you'll notice that my criticisms are mainly only pointed at the writing. If you're watching this just to have fun, or maybe you're simply more forgiving of gaps in writing than I am, then you're gonna have a far better time with this anime than I am, because there are a lot of things that B just does right. Usually an anime could blame its rushing and cramming of the plot on having to adapt an entire manga. But considering that this is a Netflix original, I don't see what the excuse is here. There's a lot of fat that can be trimmed out of B to beginning, and nobody would bat an eye at it. Especially when it comes to many of his inconsequential side characters, who often take center spotlight. That time could have been better spent fleshing out the circumstances of these god fossils and how that research is used on these child experiments. And here's where I warn viewers still interested in watching B of the plot spoilers ahead. Hey, you're not gonna hurt my feelings if you don't wanna know the juicy details. That's why I'm giving you the opportunity to boot up Netflix now. But if you're still here, I'll continue. I will send you to heaven to join your friends. My friends aren't dead. It's the entire reason I was created in the first place. They are all alive inside of me. So, when everything's said and done, it turns out that one of the boy Reggies has this memory-altering eye. When a shady man comes around and convinces him that Koku will be harvesting his gift as his right as a god, the boy stages a coup at the childhood facility, which jump-started this entire manhunt for Koku. So, we do the only reasonable thing we can imagine and behead him. But. Who convinced him that he was to be an involuntary organ donor in the first place? Retired veteran cop's doctor friend, Gilbert. Yeah, with a name like that, how could he not be the villain of this anime? Here's the thing, I know I've been talking smack about writing and all, but Gilbert is actually a pretty damn good villain. He's got a split personality that is absolutely obsessed with slicing up his victims. So naturally, Gilbert falls in love with veteran detective sister, because crazy and murderous are the key to any loving relationship. Or at least would have been key had the sister loved Gilbert back. So, one slice step sister later, and we start to understand that Gilbert is an incredibly, irredeemably evil person. He hallucinates about the girl and often speaks to her as if she were real, which the detectives use against him to eventually set him up and end this man's whole career. And that's more so the abridged and highly condensed version of events. Trust me, if I told you everything, you'd probably be foaming at the mouth if you aren't already. This is an incredibly packed anime as far as the plot details and character backgrounds go, which is why I'm so baffled at this five minute long explanation during one episode. So, closing thoughts, B the beginning could have used a lot of re-edits to clean up its story, but it was far from a waste of time. It was interesting to piece together the chain of events leading to the end, and the mad crazy action along the way didn't hurt. Anyway, now I'm moving on to other material, but hopefully I will one day return for season two, and hopefully it will take more care to properly develop it's already established characters and backstory, because I really did enjoy what I saw here in Season 1. Whew! Anyway, this is that guy, and I'm out of breath. Thanks for watching.